it must have been an awesome and alarming sight. I had just arrived at the bridge over Moose Creek, and the first thing I noticed was that water had recently flowed over the top of the bridge and around one end. This bridge is a mile and a half south of Shattuck Clearing on the Moose Pond Horse Trail, a little-used route that connects trails in the Santanoni Preserve with the Northville Lake Placid Trail at Shattuck Clearing. The flood occurred on the night of July 11th when an intense storm dumped up to six inches of rain on the central Adirondacks, washing out bridges and roads over a wide area. The bridge over Moose Creek had taken a beating, but it held. This bridge was built for heavy use, with substantial timber and rock crib footings, and decking supported by steel beams. Sitting on the bridge, it struck me that this bridge made no sense at this location. The trail up from Moose Pond to Shattuck Clearing is part of the Cold River Horse Trail system designated in the late 1960s. But it seems unlikely that this bridge had been built specifically to carry horses. More likely, it was on a truck trail built by the Conservation Department as part of the response to the big blowdown of November 1950. That storm knocked down trees over a large area, and in places, most of the large trees were down, piled up like matchsticks, reminiscent of the logging waste that fueled massive fires at the turn of the 20th century. The salvage logging operation was intended to reduce the fire risk by removing logs that could serve as fuel for fires and by dropping the slash, branches, tops, and small trees, to the ground where they could decompose. The big fires of the past burned vividly in the memories of my grandparents' generation, and there was little opposition to the salvage plan at the time. But the Conservation Department weakened the case for salvage logging by adding that it would be wasteful to leave the downed timber in the woods. This argument put the entire enterprise on shaky ground. That's because the New York State Constitution prohibits the removal of timber, including downed timber, from the Forest Preserve. Immediately following the storm, the New York State Attorney General ruled that cleanups to reduce the risk of fire were justified by the dire nature of the emergency, and the Conservation Department immediately began writing contracts whereby loggers would remove the salvaged downed timber and pay the state for the logs. By the summer of 1951, logs were coming out of the woods, not only from state lands, but also from large private tracts where loggers had a much easier time of it. And this flood of logs created a problem. By late 1952, the pulpwood market was saturated, and many salvage loggers were losing money. The effectiveness of the program was tested when a lightning-ignited fire broke out in July of 1953 in an area north of the Cold River and four miles east of Shattuck Clearing. This location was in the middle of a remote block of blowdown where no salvage work had been done. But the Conservation Department had prepared, and an immediate response put a hundred men into the field in just the first 24 hours. That effort, and the heavy rain the next day, brought the fire under control. In the analysis that followed, the department rightfully noted that their extensive planning and pre-positioning of equipment had allowed for the rapid response. They also acknowledged that the rain was largely responsible for controlling the blaze. The report went to some length to call out the usefulness of a road built to Shattuck Clearing just the year before. Which brings us once again to the bridge at Moose Creek. That bridge was built to carry heavy vehicles, but you can't drive to that bridge without the road to Shattuck Clearing. The bridge and the roads pushed into previously roadless areas beyond were built sometime after that. The Conservation Department of that era was fond of road building and had been constructing what they called fire truck trails into remote areas since the 1930s. 
There was pushback against that, but 150 miles of gravel roads had been built. And the salvage operation provided justification to build more. Tucked away in the department's 1956 summary report to the legislature is a note that an additional 90 miles of truck trails were built as part of the blowdown response. The big blowdown salvage was a significant event in the history of the Forest Preserve, but few detailed records have been found. The Conservationist magazine, published by the Conservation Department itself, provides summary information. But as the salvage progressed, an increasingly self-congratulatory narrative became intertwined with the department's push to open up the forest preserve to logging. Many in the conservation department believed that the state should allow logging on state-owned lands and that leaving the forests to the whims of nature was wasteful. Opponents noted that setting the forest aside with no logging was the very reason the Forest Preserve designation had been added to the state constitution. By the early 1960s, various commissions and panels were debating the future of the Forest Preserve, and it came to a head in 1967 when a proposal for an Adirondack National Park brought the issue to broad public attention. The National Park idea was a non-starter but it stimulated a reevaluation of how the forest preserve should be managed, leading within a few years to the Adirondack Park Agency, wilderness designations, regional zoning, and lots of controversy. And the idea of allowing salvage logging in the forest preserve would come up again. In 1995, a severe thunderstorm with winds reaching 100 miles per hour, toppled trees in the western Adirondacks. Calls to allow for the salvage of downed timber followed, and the state held a series of public meetings to consider the options. But large timber producers showed little interest in the possibility, noting that salvage logging is costly and dangerous. And the heaviest blowdown on the forest preserve lands lay in the heart of the Five Ponds Wilderness. The authorization of the 1950s salvage program had never been tested in court, but setting the Constitution aside a second time to allow logging in a designated wilderness area would have faced intense opposition. These realities put the brakes on the idea before it really got going. In the wake of the storm, noted ecologist Jerry Jenkins led a study of the effects of large-scale blowdown events in the Adirondacks. Jenkins found that assigning damage classifications to broad areas commonly misrepresents the situation on the ground. The largest trees are likely to be the ones that come down, but even in areas where the damage is said to be severe, live trees, saplings, and shrubs will remain. Removing salvageable logs without also downing the live trees and disrupting the understory is nearly impossible, which delays the regeneration of the forest canopy. And that canopy and the moisture it retains is the primary reason that large fires are uncommon in the Adirondacks. For this reason, in at least some places, the damage caused by salvage logging may increase the fire risk not decrease it. Jenkins also called attention to flawed assumptions about the ecological effects of a blowdown event, assumptions that led to much misleading reporting about the effects of the storm. The Five Ponds Wilderness is nationally known as the largest area of old-growth forest in the eastern United States and many reports lamented the destruction of this unique resource. This thinking mistakenly equates old growth with the presence of large trees. The Five Ponds area had long been known for the stands of large white pines that fit with expectations of what old growth should look like. The 1995 storm brought down some of those trees, but this is just a short-term change 
in an old forest. Today, the Five Ponds Wilderness is still the largest area of old-growth forest in the eastern U.S., and it's safe to say it is still magnificent. The salvage logging operation of the 1950s was undertaken based on assumptions and attitudes that were prevalent at the time, but that we might now question. Even so, misunderstanding of what was done and the effects and effectiveness are common. But one legacy of that effort has stood the test of time. That bridge over Moose Creek might have been built without clear authorization, but I'm glad it survived the recent flood. The water in Moose Creek was running a little high the day I was there, and without the bridge, I didn't see a way across that didn't involve waiting. It's easy to talk about the sanctity of the forest preserve until it means getting your feet wet.